Though there are countless mysteries that take place on our world, there are just as many unanswered questions about outer space. Today we're going to look beyond our world to learn about some of the most interesting and unsettling space mysteries. This is Red Web. Hello, Task Force. Welcome back to Red Web. Trevor Collins is always here and with me. Back in person, smiling, giggling away, Alfredo Diaz. What's I'm up, dude? I'm so happy we're doing space. I I'm know, right? so damn excited. My, because, you know, this is the number one movie podcast about mysteries. Of course, um, of course. My favorite genre of the movies are sci-fi, like sci-fi thrillers or sci-fi uh, movies with monsters, stuff like mm-hmm. that. You yeah. Know what I mean, like, I am all about any movie that is galactic or in space or any show yeah. or whatnot, you know? I mean, like... You know, me, live long, prosper, Star Wars, Jar Jar Binks, you know, he said that. So, like, right, 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 I'm true. super excited to, like, I mean, it, it, you were so vague with the intro. Yeah. I'm just like, yeah, it could be anything. We, it's, we, it's one of those collection, uh, you know, a bunch of little mysteries. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're talking stars, aliens, uh, intergalactic travel, black yeah. holes, uh, other it's, dimensions. There's so much out there. And, you know, we we got into it a little bit with Rudlow Manor, right? The yes. UK's Area 51. We, we did an episode on that recently. And a lot of you task force hit me up because my background traditionally in my education is aerospace engineering. And so mm-hmm. from that, I've learned a lot about space. I'm a geek about space. So this is almost an excuse for me to not talk about mysteries as well, but also kind of just geek out on space a little bit. Yeah. Different theories and thoughts and everything like that. Yeah. I met, man, because you're talking about, I remember you're talking about what's Redlow Manor, right? Redlow Manor, yes. Um, imagine, right? And you only see this in like movies, but imagine for some dumb reason, they need the three of us, the head of the task force. That's not a dumb reason. They're definitely going to need us. <laughs> They're definitely going to need us. You know, it's going to be like Armageddon where they just grab three, <laughs> yeah. three boys and they say, save the planet. We need the Don't want to miss a thing. We need the world's most mediocre gamers <laughs> to help pilot this, <laughs> this uh, spaceship with the yeah, controller. Yeah. And they were just to grab us and we're taken to, you know, some secret military base and we're just... We pass by. It's like a tube with aliens mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. like uh, interdimensional force field. It's like Men in Black. Or, you know, the secretary right. is just like a pile just, of little uh, just ganglion a- aliens right. or something. You know, could you just imagine just being rushed through all that stuff? Of just like, no, no, no we got to get through that door, and then right, like, all right. the other doors are these things are just uh, I mind. Blown. You're like bending your neck to see what what's going on. In no, 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 no. We're going down to nine E, nine E. Oh, okay. I, I okay. think I would lose my. Sh- and, but my head would probably explode if through one of the doors was a bunch of trees and in those trees were uh, a bunch of Bigfoot. Oh, within the trees? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> wow. I'm like, no way! No! I refuse to believe that they mm-hmm. do, as a group, migrate in herds. All the sightings are just, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, the escaped ones, the well, big feet like, that got out. Well, just like if there was a door that we passed by, there's a ton of owls in there doing well, some mischievous stuff. We know stuff. that that's the case. <laughs> that, that's where the executive board lies, is yeah, the owl room. Is the owls, but okay. Yeah, and it also reminds me, you know, like we've done a lot of space-themed episodes, and so we're going to kind of continue on that path here. But the Bob Lazar episode, which basically featured a man who supposedly worked at Area 51 and worked mm-hmm. with aliens to the point where he had a very similar experience. He's walking by, door cracks open, and he looks through and he sees like a little alien guy. Damn. He called him the kids <laughs> because they're like three yeah. feet tall, running around. <laughs> um, yeah. So we're going to talk about a couple, just a handful of... Sm- uh, they're not smaller. They're just okay. not as much information right. around them. To, um, to be one whole episode. Yeah. Going, going back to what you just said, though, we did touch on space, but they were grounded on Earth. Right, like, exactly. This feels like this is going to be like we are shooting. Oh off yeah, of this we are off this planet. Oh, okay. we are we are within the confines of the solar yeah. system at least. Looking for, for xenomorphs. Yeah. yeah. Well, ooh. Terminator Two. No, that's what I wouldn't want. That what? xenomorphs looking little eggs sucking on your faces. Well, and... Pretty cool on T Two. Well, all right. Let's. This <laughs> 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 man's like, well, I don't know. It looked pretty cool. <laughs> ah, my chest. <laughs> Hey, and before we get into it, it's been a minute since we've had a task force drop. The old hoodies that you guys have been wanting and loving, the ones that flew off the shelves, we're bringing them back. But again, just to keep uh, true to the limited edition yep. variants, keep we have a, fresh. A, yet a different color variant. This one's crimson, and I believe it's got the embroidered task force logo on the chest. 
logo of the show down on the uh, left wrist mm -hmm. in that off white look. Let them know. Represent. Hit them. Hit them with it. Oh, dude! Somebody hit hit us up. Uh, they with their truck is all decked out in Task Force yeah, like decals like that they task made. Task Force truck, and it's I was like, "That's awesome. cool." <laughs> um, we also have the cryptid pin set. All of that is coming. You know, I think it's got the Loch Ness monster, it's got Bigfoot, it's got the Chupacabra, and it's got the Jersey Devil. No, no, no. One of those is was, is inaccurate because Mothman's, Mothman's in there. Mothman's in there. Which Hold one on. did we drop off? Jersey Devil. I think we it's definitely Mothman. Three foot tall, yoked no, looking think, demon. No, we have Jersey Devil. <laughs> let me let me try to find it. Loch Ness, I think maybe. I think we dropped Loch Ness. I think we kicked we, Loch Ness. We have, we have Bigfoot. But I'm going to keep all this in the episode because, <laughs> I mean, we might come back around to a cryptid pin I mean, set number two. look, there's a lot of cryptids to tackle. And a lot of cryptids. Hey, and I, I wouldn't recommend tackling them. But you know, we have series one coming out. Maybe there's a series two and three. Yeah. I'm just calling them series because I like I like I mean, the idea of more. We're going to keep them limited. So if you want it, limited, so. February 15th is the day to get it. Stored at receipt.com. That's when those come out. The hoodie, the cryptid pin set. Get yours, collect them, like Pokemon badges. And it supports us. And it supports the show, truly. Like, thank you. Um, it's Chupacabra, 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 Jersey Devil, Mothman, and Bigfoot. I, yeah, yeah. At the time, we hadn't covered Nessie. Yeah. You know? Or, you two know, eyes, <laughs> two hearts, three kneecaps, that's, a tongue. That's Nessie. 15 nipples. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, 15 God, feet. So many nipples. What did I just describe? The Loch Ness monster. Do you just like <laughs> run your hand through all of that? <laughs> oh god! Like, okay. like door stoppers. <laughs> bing, 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 okay. Blah, 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 blah. We're done. We're done. Support us, please. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's talk about space now. <laughs> talk about space. Well, let's talk about the first one. I and I'm pretty sure Task Force. I'll give you a beat to kind of guess what it's going to be because I feel I feel like you're all going to feel it out. You're feeling it in the back of your minds. Planet X. Oh. AKA, apparently, it's been called now a little bit more often Planet Nine. Interesting. Yeah, we'll talk like about a, that. Is it like a planet beyond Pluto? It's a planet beyond Neptune because you and I were raised where where Pluto was a kid of the family. Uh, it was in two thousand six. He was he was uh, kicked out of the family. Was. Now he's just a dwarf planet. But then now there's talks about maybe it is a planet. Well, I don't know. It it's depends just, on what you want to define I mean, a planet as. It doesn't fit the modern definition. It's not big enough. Yeah. But yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that. But yes, essentially, this is a theoretical planet that exists beyond Neptune and definitely beyond, far beyond Pluto. But uh, we'll, we'll kind of walk through it. So, uh, starting with Neptune, it was discovered in 1846, and since then, the world has been essentially enamored with the idea of planets beyond the known continuing to orbit the sun, and that's really, that's really where this idea kind of stems from. Astronomer Percival Lowell believed in a ninth planet. He called it Planet X, and in 1906, Lowell actually created a team in order to search for it. So, right or wrong, he's made a team with which he's going to observe the solar system and see if that planet isn't out there. Now, he felt that Uranus and Neptune had unpredictable orbits due to the gravitational pull of a yet-to-be-discovered ninth planet. And, and for what it's worth, that's actually how Neptune was discovered, because when people looked at Uranus, they were like, oh my God. this is an unpredictable path that it's right. taking. And because of the gravitational pull of Neptune, that is what accounted for that unpredictability. These planets all mess with each other. They're in such a delicate balance because their their gravitational pulls right. actually pull on each other. But yeah, so he's he's now saying, all right, there's got to be a ninth planet out there. Pluto was actually discovered by the Lowell Observatory by one Clyde Tombaugh in 1930. Tombaugh had taken photographs and used what is called a blink comparator to flip between the images quickly to try and find any changes. If you've seen Don't Look Up, an example of that flip comparator would be a photo uh, from one day, a photo of the next day, and you can see when right. you flip back and forth, a dot moving. And when that's, it doesn't move with everything else, you go, oh, there's something there. What is it? That's what playing her name, Katniss Everdeen, uh, did with, <laughs> yeah, with the meteor, yeah. right? Yes. Like on the wall. Yeah, That's yeah. how they figured out the... God, the movie was meteor. frustrating. It was definitely frustrating. It was so frustrating. A little too real. It was way too real. There's an asteroid coming to Earth to kill us, and people are like, nah, fake news. Yeah. <laughs> Shovel $600? That's yeah. That's real. That's going to happen. We're digging ourselves a bunker. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Dude, not going to help. Was like, Give up. Digging ourselves down low, buying shovels, selling them for $600. I was like, this is today. Yeah. People no. are that insane. Yeah. But yeah, it was found on the general idea that Lowell had predicted. 
Pluto, that is. And at first, upon this discovery, people thought, hey, this might be Planet X, this Pluto thing that we've just discovered. Uh, but in 2006, it was ultimately determined that Pluto does not qualify as a planet, and thus it was removed from the planetary list. Mm. Uh, it just doesn't have the mass necessary to affect Neptune in Dang. the sense that uh, a theoretical planet X would. That's a that's that's a villain origin story right there. Oh yeah, the planet. You don't want to you don't want to wrong the planet that's got a giant heart on it. You, you know? don't. You kicked that. You got oh, wait, huh? Well, the first clear <laughs> photos that came through of Pluto, I think, came through in the last couple of years, and it looks here. I'll pull it up for you. It looks like there. It's got a big old heart on it. Maybe it's asking to be brought back into the fold. Yeah, it, like a little love letter. Like hey, right? you know hey. what I mean? Uh, it's a little blurry, but you see it on the right on the right side there. Maybe that's where the kids are. Yeah, it's like, you the know. Ki- aliens, you see, Chris, yeah. the kid oh, aliens, oh, Christian. Oh. Why are you calling kids? That's what, um, that's, that's what Bob Lazar yeah, called them. Yeah, Bob oh, called them. I honestly wasn't listening during that part. So. <laughs> the entire episode. You know when our man in the chair is like, huh, what? <laughs> yeah. I've got stuff to read. You're talking about aliens? Who said anything about aliens? Kids, huh? <laughs> said anything about kids? Kids, huh? Kids, what? In space? <laughs> Now, despite this, right, I, I don't think it stubbed the toe of the curiosity of Planet X, right? It basically said, okay, we've got Pluto, we found Pluto, excellent news. It might have been coincidental that Pluto was out there because it wasn't really messing with Neptune's orbit like it was theorized. But basically, because of that, people are like, nah, the Planet X is still out there, still must exist. Now, it is worth mentioning that multiple dwarf planets, as they're now called, have been discovered uh, far beyond Neptune. There's actually one within the asteroid belt that we're going to talk about here in this in this next, uh, you know, mini mystery, if mm-hmm. you will. But but beyond Neptune and Pluto, there is also the Kuiper Belt. Fifty astronomical units, AUs, from the Sun. An astronomical unit, for those who may not know, is essentially the distance between the average distance between the Sun and the Earth. So if that tells you just how far away from the sun it is, it's 50 Jesus. times further. Jesus. It would take, if if light takes about eight minutes from the sun to us, it would take about six hours and 40 minutes to get out there. Light. Holy. Mm-hmm. Okay. So there are things called extreme trans-Neptunian objects. I'd never heard of this before, but they're called ETNOs. Basically, things beyond Neptune in this Kuiper belt. Uh, that are clustered together and have unique orbits that are perpendicular to the orbits of the inner planets and sometimes orbiting in the opposite direction. Now, this is very strange because, as you can imagine, our solar system, Mm -hmm. everything lies mostly within a plane, a flat disk around the sun, and we all essentially orbit in the the same direction. That is due to the the stability of orbits, because essentially when a star is created, there's a, a cloud of gas around it, a cloud of rock and material, and it's essentially just chaos. It's orbiting in all sorts of directions. But over time, uh, they are inclined to, when they start colliding into one another, they break up the orbits that aren't stable and gravity pulls everything. And, and to simplify it, basically, it finds a homeostasis where it becomes stable. And that's why, on the whole, 99% of solar systems end up orbiting in the same direction and orbiting in a planar disk. It is very rare, but it has been seen where one planet is going the opposite direction. Oh, that's terrifying. Or there's a planet that is perpendicular. Wow. Not very common because of the gravitational effects of that. Would right. Would either cause them to collide or cause things to be thrown off into space and create rogue planets, which are scary and exist because they're, they're planets that are so cold that they are almost impossible to see because they don't really generate any light or heat. And they're just flying through space. Oh, my God. God, that's and that's another thing. Th- yeah, that's actually a theory. I think that w- I don't have in my notes, but that's actually a theory for what Planet X could be. So, is Planet X supposed to be past the asteroid belt? So, Planet X has a lot of shapes and forms. It's kind of a catch-all for this idea of an apocalyptic planet that what? has a huge and and that again theorized huge orbit of fifteen to twenty thousand years. Our orbit is clearly a year. That's what defines a year. Right. But if this orbit is twenty thousand years. First of all, we would have uh, seen it in human history. Yeah. Uh, we would have felt its effects, but I don't know. Not since modern man, really, has that. Ha- would that have come around? You know what I mean? But back to my notes. I could Listen, I could rant on and on. Yeah. 
Oh, I'm loving this episode. But it's theorized that Planet X could have a mass 10 times larger than that of Earth and an orbit somewhere between 10 and 20,000 years. That is some serious mass. And that's where a lot of people think of this as an apocalyptic event. And it's also why it's been part of other conspiracy theories, things of that nature, such as 2012, right? The end of the world was supposed to be 2012. And, and I remember at that time, people were like, Planet X is going to come out of nowhere. It's going to fly through the solar system, what orbit the around hell? the sun, go right back out to wherever it came from. And doing that with that massive uh, level of gravitation, yeah, it's going to throw everything into the space, right? Earth's going to get ejected or get collided into or something. Even uh, say Earth wasn't colliding into any other planet or anything else. Yeah. Like, what would that transition, would that be a fast, I'm assuming possibly like a fast transition right if we were floating out away from our sun yeah there's a yeah you you would uh you would notice it pretty quickly right if you were being ripped away from the sun it'd be fast we'd f it's pretty much freeze yeah very quickly i mean give it not very long it depends on yeah. right how fast it was ejected and whatnot but yeah we would uh right very quickly start losing our atmosphere and well maybe not i mean not lose the atmosphere but I think temperatures would drastically drop, Dr right? Temperatures would drastically drop. Plant life would very quickly die out due to the lack of yeah. sun and the freezing temperatures. And sun then, would, yeah, sun would take longer to get to us, so that would mess with our night and day cycles. Yep. See, like... Communications would be interrupted with all of our satellites being cattywampus. Yeah. See, everyone talks about, like, oh, what if, like, an asteroid hits or anything like that, right? Like, you know, like, hey, maybe Clint is going to send an asteroid to us. Um, but I don't think the arachnids are quite there yet with their technology. Um, what's going on? <laughs> Who's talking about spiders? No, Clendathu, the arachnids. All I know is Shelob <laughs> and the Shelob's mother, which name I can never remember because it's too complicated. You don't know about Clendathu? Clendathu. They shoot. Yeah, it's a big planet. Oh, a bug I planet. It. <laughs> 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 yes, I get that reference that you made. <laughs> Ungolian. Anyway, that's for uh, the Lord of the Rings fans out there. Starship Troopers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie. Rico, you know what to do. Um, Jeremy Irons. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you don't think about like a planet misaligning. I don't really think I've seen that in like a show or like a movie. I really heard about it in any way, shape, or form. Just yeah. like people theorizing about the planet just being sent out into space. As opposed to like, meteors are going to hit and we're all going to freeze. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting how fragile this planet is. Real quick, just as a little geek out. We're talking about Pluto, talking about weird orbits. It always stood out to me. I mean, Pluto is definitely a trans-Neptunian object because its orbit, you might not know, youth of the task force kind of after pluto was ripped from our scientific textbooks in 2006 its orbit is actually askew right i'm holding my hand horizontal for fredo and then i'm giving my other hand a basically like a 15 degree angle to it that's that is the plutonian orbit it is shifted it is not flat along with the rest of the planets and it also comes within neptune's orbit and then goes back outside of neptune's orbit so sometimes it's closer in the neptune sometimes it's further out that's crazy imagine yeah. if the moon was that way wait doesn't the moon affect the tides the moon affects the tides yeah so that would that could stop real bad <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> the moon's closer this month here's, well, the moon's also here's quite a, giant a bit bigger tidal than wave. pluto yeah it's which massive. is interesting yeah. and also i mean this is its own little mini mystery there's conspiracy theories all over the place as to what the moon is and why it's there that it was placed there that it's a space station because it is the biggest moon to planet ratio that we know of not only in the solar system but i think that we know at all right now and also it just so happens that the moon is in a perfect rotation it the way it rotates and mm -hmm. orbits us is in such a way that it always has the exact same face of the moon facing us. So as it's rotating, as it's spinning, it's orbiting it us. Does, but so it you always see the same side. And and proportionally, it is the perfect uh, from our perspective. It is the same size as the sun in the sky, hence getting perfect yeah. solar and lunar eclipses. So there are a lot of people going, it's too perfect. What is wrong with it? <laughs> it must be a, a space egg. It's the Decepticons. <laughs> it's the on the moon. Um, 
Yeah, I didn't really think about that, honestly. Yeah, yeah that's just a little fun one for you. Tickle and your it perfectly brain. lines up and it cl- what? Here's yeah. the thing that I've always thought about. Like, Damn, I think, I love space. I think that that's interesting, <laughs> but I also think that like if if it's such a rare condition, which life is, you know, we look at all the rare conditions that surround us, and I'm like, well, there's rare conditions that surround all uh, all over Everywhere. the place that don't exist Everywhere. here. Everywhere. So I'm like, you know, if the moon was integral to stirring up the tides, shaking up the waters and creating life here on Earth, then... Uh, it just so happened to be. Right. Then I don't think it, you know, anyway. We like to attribute rarity to uh, uh, someone doing it yeah. intentionally, but yeah. I just think that, like, eventually rare things happen. Anyway, let's get back to Planet X because uh, I think it is a very interesting idea. It's supposed to be an apocalyptic planet? I mean, some people have used it as a tool for their apocalypse, like right. the, the vessel of their apocalypse. Other people have just kind of theorized that it's out there because, honestly, Pluto, we never had, we didn't have a clear image of Pluto because of how small and how close it is. Hubble can't focus on it. And so we weren't able to see it until we had a drive by of a satellite go past it. So there are reasons as to why we would kind of theorize that there's a planet that we just don't know about. Yeah. But some people kind of take it in a more fanciful direction, and some people take it as more of scientific intrigue. But let's just jump into the theories that we have. This is a simple one. It's, it either does exist or it does not right. exist, as far as the theories go. So let's break down the idea that it doesn't exist. On the whole, most scientists agree that Planet X, aka Planet 9, does not exist, primarily due to the lack of convincing evidence. I think that's fair. That's what science leans on. Yep. As a planet as large as theorized would have been seen by now, most likely, especially if it's 10 times the mass of Earth, especially with all the advanced telescopes we have now, but the wrinkle to that idea is that perhaps, just because it's huge doesn't mean you have to see it, it could also be so far away that our technology can't see it or doesn't know to, like how to find it. I don't know. But either way, it doesn't mean that there isn't something worth studying in that area of space And so this kind of, this level of intrigue, I think, is healthy because it keeps people driving for answers. Not always the answers you're expecting, but that's why you hypothesize. Yep. And then you can also discover other random things as well. It led to, in a a sense, the discovery of Pluto, right? I wouldn't have known that there was a giant heart on a planetoid until (laughs) until then, you know, without this, this planet being theorized. But on a more fun direction, let's talk about the idea that it does exist. I personally find it challenging to think of it existing in the massive disruptive sense that we have built it around. Um, but if it's something small or, a, or a, I guess Neptune and Uranus aren't really gas giants, they're their own class. But if it's something like that, I find it deeply fascinating. It gives us another planet to really closely yep. look at and understand how planets form and how life could form. But Send probes out. But uh, I mean, so the less fanciful idea is that it does exist, but um, you know, what have you. So despite the conspiracy theories and the doubt around this planet, there are still many scientists too that also believe that planet X could exist, could, in the most distant parts of our solar system. You have Batygin and Brown who were skeptics uh, originally before their research on planet nine. I actually think I skipped over talking about Batygin and Brown, so I'm going to go back real quick. You know, I talked about some of those extreme trans-Neptunian objects in the Kuiper belt. Uh, Well, based on mathematical models that Constantine Batygin and Mike Brown of Caltech theorized in 2015, they basically theorized that these unique Kuiper Belt orbits, whether it be of Pluto or other planet dwarf planet kind of orbits, they're saying that basically those have weird orbits because of Planet X. And they're also the two people that established the idea of Planet 9 to basically give it a, a more official name. I think X was just a placeholder Especially since it became before Pluto, it couldn't mean planet 10. So suffice it to say, Batygin and Brown were saying, okay, we have dwarf planets out there with weird orbits. Potentially, it's because of this planet 9. There are also other valid reasons for that. But they were skeptics initially until they started doing their research. Oh. Hence the support here now why we're talking about the theory of it existing. Oh, okay. As of 2018... There were 14 objects orbiting the sun with similarly strange orbits that Batygin and Brown's work had pointed to as the evidence for Planet X. These strange orbits include descriptors like they're extremely long or perhaps even clustered orbits or even strangely enough perpendicular or counter rotation orbits. Those just don't happen very often. Now this was interesting and and actually news to me 
One of these 14 objects was discovered by Carnegie Institution of Science in 2015, and its name is The Goblin. <laughs> there is a dwarf what? planet out there called <laughs> The Goblin, with the word the, The Goblin. What? The Goblin. <laughs> it's so far away that planets like Neptune don't even have an effect on its orbit. That's how far out it is. Yeah, Neptune big. Ooh, Which could big suggest boy. that something else could be causing its strange orbit. Or the fact that it's so far out, in my humble opinion, the fact that it's so far out in space is why it can have such a strange orbit. Because ain't nothing touching it. But wouldn't it just float away? You'd think, but that's just how dramatic the sun's gravitational pull is. And how small this goblin thing is. So you think that the goblin is so far away that it has a weird rotation, mm -hmm. but it's still within the sun's gravitational grasp. Yes. I can see that, right? Yeah. I mean, the I, sun I, I, is massive. Right. The sun is massive. I also wouldn't think that its gravitational pull would, wouldn't just cut off, right? It would be a gradual descent in terms of... And then from there, who knows how it plays with different planets and how they move. That's interesting you say it like that. I mean, in layman's terms, yeah, it would gradually fall off. But in a sense, I guess if you think about it, you are either affected by the gravity or you are not, right? And so there will be a bubble with which the solar system ends, right? The The sun will have an impact on this side of the bubble and not on that side of the bubble, right? I mean, well, I mean... Voyager 2 just crossed through that a few years ago, right? It's in that intergalactic space now where it's... So cool. Outside of the so cool. the uh, impact of the sun, that's so cool. But then, hmm. Well, I guess it's just like different planets have their own atmospheres in which they have different measurements of gravitational pull. Hence, like why you float more on the moon. Yeah, I don't know. It's all interesting. I love it. Oh man. Yeah. Take a look at this. This is uh, the heliosphere. There is what's called the termination shock, then there's the heliosphere, which is essentially the area of space that is influenced by the sun and the Voyager satellites that have been thus ejected from our solar system. It's interesting because it looks a lot like the Earth's magnetic field. It does. Because of the galactic impact on the solar system is similar to the sun's impact on the Earth. But we are on the edge of the heliosphere? Right, because the... Solar, uh, there's solar the, winds, right? So I imagine there's galactic winds essentially yeah. pushing back the bubble of the heliosphere. It's very interesting. Damn, so intriguing. Would That's, you go to space? Deep yeah. space? Deep space? Ooh. Depends on the technology and, and if I can get back. Right Would you now, go on a five year journey in which you can return in search of Planet X? Uh, no, I don't go searching for Planet X. No way. <laughs> I, I think I'd, I'd be searching willing to look at some planets. Planet X? Mm -hmm. Nah. Yeah, oh, cool. I'd be willing oh. to look at some planets, you know, and then come back. I'm not beyond <laughs> that. You go far enough out that everything starts to look the same. Like a <laughs> sightseeing yeah. tour, essentially. You go 50 light years that way. You go 100 light years that way. Yeah. I wouldn't tell the difference. Yeah, it's like, I don't. It's I like don't driving know. through the Great Plains. <laughs> Where am I? It's all the same. No, <laughs> <It's> like, no <laughs> clue. Sorry, it Oklahoma. <laughs> I mean, it all depends. It all depends. Right. But ultimately, those 14 planetoids are not enough data points for most scientists to go, yeah, that's enough evidence. So, you know, it's still out there. It's still an idea. It's very interesting. It's enough to intrigue me, though. It's enough to intrigue It's, me. it's intriguing, to... though. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's Planet X. I mean, as cleanly as I can give it without going off the rails. On right. I mean, we, we, you can there's, absolutely. There's space knowledge. I know that, like I'm on the periphery of knowledge. Right. Like, but the heliosphere, I'm not informed enough to really speak with authority. Exactly. And, then, and there's, but I, there's a ton of different theories and counter yeah. theories. But man, is that. I would like to think that there is. Sure. Yeah. I mean, like, I would love for that to be the case because, I mean, even now we're still learning about Neptune. I watched this video the other day about Neptune and how there was this giant dark spot on it you know, a few decades ago, and now it's subsequently gone because it's just this giant ball of hydrogen, this this right. planet, and it has this giant storm at one point that has since faded, unlike the insane the storm on Jupiter, the red spot. Oh, man. Just the planets in our solar systems alone are just... Oh, yeah. And the moons, man, that just like, you yeah. know, you talk about Europa, you talk about Ganymede, you talk about all these moons that could be harboring strange... Uh, titan 
there's just no way that we are the only living beings in the universe. There's no way. Yeah. Right? In some way, shape, or form in this ever-expanding universe that theoretically started from the Big Bang and, and that the explosion is ever expanding. There's God, something. I'm something just ready. I'm just ready for the James Webb telescope to hit that Lagrange point. I said L4, you know, a couple mm. episodes ago. It's L2, Lagrange point two. Okay. It's where we're headed. I just wanted to correct that before Task Force really jumps on it and lets me know. I'm bang. Oh, but we're gonna no. see the Big Bang theoretically, whatever that looks LV, like. LV. I don't know. What I forgot. You, what are you thinking? Aliens. LV. I forgot the planet. It was LV something. LV aliens? Yeah, alien, the alien planet. L- oh, from alien. From alien. Oh, oh from oh, alien. Oh. Yeah, from alien. It was LV. I want to see something. I don't know. I don't know. Gonna bug me. It is. Well, there's LV426. like LV four two six. Four two six. Yeah. Yeah, I knew there's like it. a two in there, but yeah, that doesn't help. The problem is and everything. most of these planets are just like a couple letters and then a smearing of numbers. And yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Go, okay. And then someone goes, would you like to buy a star? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's talk about, you know, speaking of dwarf planets, we have another very interesting one that I honestly didn't know much about. So I'm excited to cover it. Again, it's, it is kind of more mini mystery. So I have my own thoughts on it. But let's talk about the bright spots on the dwarf planet Ceres. So Ceres is a dwarf planet in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. It is 14 times smaller in mass than Pluto. The diameter of Ceres is about 940 kilometers to Pluto's 2,344 kilometers. So remember, we're talking mass here, but so it's it's a decent size for an object. It yeah. takes, I think, it holds about 25 percent of the asteroid belt's mass, but oh. it's still very small in the grand scheme of things. So, quick side question: Yeah, asteroid belt just clump of different like pieces of planets that never got their form or pieces of just a bunch of rocky yeah. formations and some maybe some ice and, and things of that nature yeah, in a sorry. in a belt uh they it's just become a stable belt i mean something like that over the sense you know over millennia could eventually cluster together to form a planet and you might be thinking like oh a series maybe is one of those i don't know it may be on yeah. the, in the on the terms of billions of years right it could become a <laughs> planet never and, see mess up the solar system but i love it yeah so this planetoid this dwarf planet has bright spots on it there's these bright clusters called spots or facula and there are hundreds of them they reflect more light than the rest of the material on series and so a lot of people have started to wonder what are those bright spots especially these were discovered actually very recently by the dawn spacecraft in 2015 so they're very recent and a lot of them are near craters, which of course Ceres being in the asteroid belt is covered with. And these spots eerily resemble that of lit up cities. When you look at cities on Earth at nighttime, how the city is sprawling with light, Mm. it kind of looks a lot like that. Here, I'll show you an image there, that top one. And of course, you know, we'll post these images on our Twitter and YouTube pages at Red Web Pond. Yeah, why would it reflect like that? Maybe I don't I don't know. Maybe the minerals form diamonds or Yeah. Or right? maybe it's an alien civilization on the tiniest planet in the most dangerous stretch of space. I don't know. But the fact that they're near craters, I think, is very telling. But the fact that they look like cities is just it's too uh, I mean, humans always look for patterns that are familiar to them. And so it, it's just it's really pulled people's attention. They're like, wow, is it aliens? Yeah, I mean, because you say that they're near craters or in craters, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't really look like there's like a... I would assume that if an asteroid had a planet and if it was like maybe that asteroid had ice that hasn't thawed out on the planet. Like why isn't it even is what you're going to say? Like why isn't it like an even spread or Mm. some type... You know what I mean? Like it just seems like a weird... Splotchy. Like it, like it, a splotchy city, like it's just like yeah. a city of lights, and so it just you just the lights branch out to wherever the heck it was built, as opposed to like this looks like boom impact with you know the impact spread. Right. I mean that's true. I mean normally when we see an impact crater, you see it as a round thing, and it is more or less even unless it's been like eons, right? Mm-hmm. Now the largest spot, the one I just showed you, is called Spot Five. It's located in the crater. Funnily enough entitled the Aw Cater, 
they got really clever with that name there. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> the Alcator Crater. <laughs> now, it is worth mentioning and reiterating, I should say, that most of these spots are located in an impact crater. And to me, that says mm. a lot. But before we go down that path, uh, one mountain on Sirius called Ahuna Mons has bright lights streaking down the sides of it. So I say lights, but it's it's that same reflective pattern. But instead, it's going down the sides of this mountain in lines a little bit. Bro, why? Very interesting. I just showed Fredo the image of that. Why? Why does it look like that? It's very strange. Now, at first, it was unknown what was causing these highly reflective spots. You know, it could be people were theorizing maybe it's volcanic activity, maybe it's water, or some kind of alien cities, right? Of course, every, every answer to under the sun is viable. But in 2017, the Dawn spacecraft that discovered them two years prior was able to take high quality images of some of these spots. And they got up close. I mean, like 21 miles away, what? 34 kilometers from these things. I, they approached that thing. Oh, so we got an answer. 21 miles away. We'll get some good images at least. Maybe not the answer. We haven't bombarded this thing with probes to test it or land on it. Start probing the of these planets. Yeah. Start probing it. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Don was also able to assist scientists in measuring different aspects of Ceres, and they realized that these spots were actually spouts of briny water, and that ultimately, because of that, Ceres must have been full of water. So, essentially, we have an answer now to this little mini-mystery, which is nice. An open-closed case within the past couple years, it was discovered and answered pretty subsequently. But, the question then becomes, where did the water come from? Hello, Task Force. Just... Kind of parting the seas of the mystery, as I always do, to talk to you directly about, you know, some of our fantastic sponsors. But this is also where I just talk about Red Web and the goings on of our little podcast here. Thank you all for indulging me as I talk a little bit about space and, and kind of lose the thread a little bit. Uh, because, man, I like to geek out on space. Reminder, we've got the Task Force hoodie in crimson that's coming out, as well as those cryptid pins coming to store.roosterteeth.com on February 15th. Mark your calendars. They're coming soon. And if you get those, it supports the show directly. So thank you so much for doing that. Another way to support the show, if you're not uh, store inclined, is to share this with your friends, anybody that you want to talk to, bring into the Task Force, chat about mysteries with, or simply review the podcast on Spotify and on iTunes. It's a great way to let their algorithms know that we're worth listening to. It's a very competitive market out there, and I think we have a very strong carved out niche in the unsolved mysteries space. So all of those reviews help us find new task force members and continue having these discussions with you all, uh, which I really appreciate. With that said, I would like to talk about some of today's sponsors. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by HelloFresh. New year, new meals. It's the perfect time for saving time and money, learning to cook, eating healthier, everything like that. Whatever your goals are, HelloFresh can help. They send fresh pre-measured ingredients directly to your door so you can skip all of the hassles and still get that meal variety that you deserve. It's got the low cost of the grocery store, but the convenience of staying in. They've also got farm fresh produce that arrives within a week, giving you the convenience without skimping on the quality and freshness. HelloFresh helps cut that time that you spend in the kitchen sweating over your meals. You shouldn't really be sweating into your food, but if you are, you can cook and get those meals ready in 30 minutes or less. They even have quick and easy meals if you prefer that, that include 20 minute recipes with low prep and easy cleanup. You know I love that. Because uh, the last thing you want is to cook a bunch of meals, have to do a big cleanup, spend an hour in the kitchen. Oh, it's silly. And it's 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal, but it has the same quality. You get it right to your door. You feel like a chef. I use HelloFresh and it makes my meal planning very easy because I can look at the meals coming in as uh, the menu evolves over the weeks. And it also helps me feel like I know what I'm doing in the kitchen. These are recipes that you can also keep. And so if you ever want to revisit it, but it's not on the HelloFresh menu, boom, you can still do it and it still tastes very good. So if this sounds interesting to you, go to HelloFresh.com slash RedWeb16 and use code RedWeb16 for up to 16 free meals and three free gifts. Again, that's 16 free meals and three free gifts at HelloFresh.com slash RedWeb16 using code RedWeb16. This episode of RedWeb is also sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. We've talked about BetterHelp before on Red Web. I'm sure, Task Force, that you remember. But right now, we're discussing some of the stigmas around mental health. All humans have emotions, and we need to learn to move through them, not avoid them. 
We take care of our bodies in the gym. We go to the doctor. Why not take care of our mental health as well? BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with your therapist in just under 48 hours. Give it a try. See why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. Red Web is sponsored by BetterHelp, and Task Force members get 10% off of your first month at BetterHelp.com slash Red Web. That's B-E-T-T-E-R. H-E-L-P dot com slash red web. And with that, let's float about the mysteries deep in space. And so we'll talk about some of those theories. One popular one, as always, is that meteors, icy meteors full of frozen water, uh, in kind of collecting to create the small planet of Ceres, because it is spherical, meaning it's got enough gravitational pull to, to round out that it just must have collected some icy meteors over the over the years and that's another that's a popular theory as to how earth got water and then the water became this briny slush with the coldness of Ceres and the the kind of material the minerals that are on that planet but some scientists such as Lene Quick actually believe in a different theory uh, they believe that the water spots on this planet are actually left over from an ancient ocean that this was once covered in water doesn't really say where the water came from, but instead it answers where the brine spots are coming from. And they're saying that this could have been a global ocean, although small, uh, eventually, you know, with the atmosphere that was theoretically there holding the water in liquid form, if that evaporated and disappeared, then eventually the water would boil off and go to space. But the hole in that theory is that not every crater on Ceres has these spots. And she says, well, that's because it froze. So I don't know. It, yeah. It's interesting. But the last theory kind of addressing this water is that of icy lava, right? Putting it in colloquial terms, that is, there are what are called cryovolcanoes in space that essentially emit frozen water and hypercold briny water. Briny water is essentially salty water, not like with sodium chloride that we know of, but with perchlorates, which are just in the family of salts. Essentially, that this water is collected by perchlorates, which are magnets for water. So suddenly you have this like very thick, briny, salt-based fluid that has attracted this water. And so you end up with this sludge. But I digress. These cryovolcanoes emit this sludge water and ice and just hyper-cold material rather than molten rock and lava that we are, you know, accustomed to. Ice volcanoes? Jesus Christ! This is so basically so cool. That's what they're saying is is possible here that the, these reflections on Ceres could be oh. the result of cryovolcanoes. Okay, I mean now that I know that that exists, yeah, yeah. No, that 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 would look like it would be something like that. Yeah, and that's why you would see them in the craters, but you would also see them on the mountains because within this kind of sub theory, it is that it is said that Hunamans is is one of those cryovolcanoes. Um, either way, I think it's all very interesting, and, and it's fascinating as hell. I mean, yeah. even if that's literally what it is, like yeah. it's just—I didn't know there was ice volcanoes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it's all so intriguing to find out and learn about things past my knowledge and beyond our planet. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting too because you know when these first showed up, people were like, "What is that?" And I love—that's what I love about science and space—is that there's so much. What is that? Let's figure it out. We have the answer. We know now that it is brine water, right? We know, for example, on Mars, in the recent years, we discovered that there are water flows on the surface of Mars, seasonal, with this very same briny material that, like, this sludge kind of comes up to the surface. It flows, if you can even say that, for a little bit, and then it kind of resides or whatever. See, I love that. I love that there's, like, comparable data. Yeah. Now... It's getting a little hairy. We're getting away from, from like, or at least my mental map of this topic we're getting away from. But my instinct is when you see this shiny material, this reflective material near impact spots, my thought is, well, it's the composition of the planet. It's the composition of this dwarf planet that what if it was all iron or these were just giant chunks of iron that, True. you know, a, another asteroid comes, bangs it yep. and just shows a bunch of shiny metal then. Yeah. It could be the material from the asteroid right. or something that's 
deeper within the planet. Mm -hmm. So for sure. Um, or that this planet, if we've now figured out that this is brine water, that uh, you know that this planet just has a lot of it within it, and so these fresh impact sites just happen to show more of it. So wait, going back because when you said this, I went, wait, what? Yeah. Then, well, by the way, I, I recognize meteorites. things can get really messy really quickly with me in space. So stop me. Oh no, 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 stop no, no, me no, in my no, tracks. No. I, this to. has all been. Uh, fairly easy to digest honestly i would say easy to digest um now i'm going back to the fact that like the common go-to theory for why there's water on earth is because an asteroid and like an ice asteroid hit earth is that a question yeah yeah so that is one of the theories as to how I water never, ended up here i never knew that yeah what's wild is that i mean when you really think about it we it's so easy to take for granted everything that's going what on what the hell is a big ass how big was that ice asteroid? Probably. Let me blow Why your mind. Why did it destroy the planet? Oh my god, my mind right now. Ah! I'm going to look something up because me. I want to know the name of this thing. But Tell me I take a scoop of the ocean and I'm drinking asteroid water. <laughs> Bro, you are. Let me blow. Yes. A Let me blow your mind even more. I take a scoop. You could take a scoop of ocean water. You might be drinking dinosaur piss. You take a you you oh, you shit. are. You, let me blow your oh, mind even further. It, no. This is why space is is wild. Please, if you're a task force member, you're out there looking like, what am I going to study when I go to college? Look into STEM. That sh might be dry as hell on paper. It might be tough, <laughs> but this is the cool sh you get to do anyway. This is what's really going to blow your mind because. You extrapolate that thought process that you're already starting, and I love that, uh, that you're on that path. You take a scoop of water, everything on this planet comes from space. Everything that we touch right here was generated in the heart of a star. And and reform like this wood table was, was minerals created from the star that collided and created a planet, and then life became sentient and then took those materials and formed them into new materials, and then us humans took those materials and reshaped them again. Like this wood, is just those materials made alive and then us humans then took that living material and turned it into something yet different right we are the living embodiment of the universe the universe is us and we are the universe and we are the universe witnessing itself because every atom that we're made of was created in a star so we're everything that you see is just stardust it's it's wild and he's just Fredo's just looking at his hands like like, in real like Neo. <laughs> he just touched the mirror of the Matrix. Like, I am the universe. <laughs> we really are. We take for granted all these paths. And we're just like, oh, oh we're just man. these hairless monkeys walking around, <laughs> lost our tails. There's Bigfoot out there and stuff. But like, My life, life is changed. Life is just <laughs> material that became self aware. I can take a scoop of an asteroid, <laughs> of asteroid water. <laughs> Just take a scoops of stuff. Uh, maybe it's dinosaur piss. I don't know. You gotta take the good with the bad. Yeah, yeah. Asteroid I mean? water, dinosaur oh piss. My, oh it's my god, dude! I man, I didn't I mean to blow space. your brain in that way, but I was going to say, like in recent years, there was this, a discovery of what is essentially a nebula, if that's the right word for it. And I don't know if there's a name for this, Christian. If you want to look it up, but somewhere deep out in space, there was water discovered, and I'm talking so much water that it is thousands of Earth's worth, if not more. It is just billions of gallons of water, obviously frozen due to the vacuum of space, just out there. There's just like this cluster of water out in space that was discovered in recent years. And it's just like, space is wild. Anything <laughs> that can exist does exist. We so think of water crazy. as this hyper rare thing. And I'm like, and it kind of is. And we look for it because we think of it as the basis of life and that it, yeah. all life is reliant upon water but yeah there's there's this again i don't know if it's a nebula or, or if there's a better word for it but there's just i mean tons proper of water in space. the proper gases get together in space for water and then from there it just freezes over so is there like a frozen abstract river essentially or ocean or is it on a planet oh this is just out in space yeah i just looked it up there there's no name for it it's just a water cloud that's yeah 30 billion miles away and yeah it's Damn. So big, it's essentially like uh, imagine all of the oceans on Earth times 140 trillion. Oh, that's how much water is just Whoa. floating out in this this singular cloud. <laughs> Frozen. Yeah. Damn, this episode's dope. 
Yeah. Oh, God. Space okay. is cool. And I mean, uh, we have all these mini mini theories, and that's why I'm saying, like, these are all just vessels for me to go off. Oh, like, so good. I, I keep forgetting we're even talking about series. Uh, yes, um, we are. Um, now, series is, is one of those mysteries that we, like, one of the rare mysteries that we cover that is actually relatively solved. And I appreciate that we covered some solved mysteries. Yes, because, because my mind would just be so frustrated <laughs> if everything was never solved. Right. But it also shows that, like, you know, eventually solutions might be coming around the corner for the un other unsolved things. Yeah, there might be a, you know, Red Web Task Force 10th year anniversary. We go back and a bunch of stuff is solved. Yeah, because we did it. <laughs> yeah, because we did it, Task Force. <laughs> but essentially, coming back to the Dawn spacecraft that discovered these shiny spots and researched it more, scientists determined that the water likely came from Ceres itself, 25 miles beneath the surface in the crust and the sublimated kind of rock. They were able to find this out because measuring the changes in the orbit and pull of the gravity on Dawn as it moved around the different areas of Ceres, kind of it, basically the gravitational spots, like density spots. This is this is all very new to me, and so I'm reading it through the, the simplified notes that I have. With very sensitive scientific equipment, they, they were basically able to confirm that okay there are reservoirs under the surface and that's where this is emanating from and then in 2020 nasa confirmed that Ceres had a brine reservoir beneath the surface the briny water was revealed when something impacted the surface which could explain why the spots were primarily found in impact craters so yeah the gut instinct of no wonder they're near impact craters is because there's something under the surface whether it be metal or in this case brine water that when it gets chipped away you reveal it like a fresh wound and it's all there and it hasn't evaporated yet. But the fact that this was such a recent discovery and then very quickly resolved through years of scientific research is very cool to me. That's amazing. Yeah. You got guys at NASA just you got those buff ladies and gentlemen over at NASA, buff, you know. Buff just, scientists at NASA. Just pulling reps and, and <laughs> banging weights, just thinking of and then their higher ups are thinking of shit up too, and then the chain goes on. Yeah, these are dreamers, you this know. Is insane, man. The You're best like, of the best. Buff polling reps and answering <laughs> yeah. questions, you know. <laughs> With their protractors in one hand <laughs> <laughs> and their barbell in the other. Never, Damn, we got some never cool attack buff. a scientist. Yeah. They've always no, got a protractor yeah. and, a, and a compass on them, you know. <laughs> They're always deceivingly buff underneath that coat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dance those muscles. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the next kind of uh, mini mystery I want to talk about because this one's super interesting to me. And again, it's it's in this episode because there's, uh, unfortunately, as titillating as it is, there's just not a whole lot of information around it. So, moon monoliths. This is a, just another vector for me to go off on, you know, Apollo 11 and, and d sightings and moons and aliens. But moon monoliths, let's jump to it. Monoliths are essentially tall, large, rocky objects, and a lot of people will associate them due to pop culture from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Those very smooth rectangular obelisks, uh, also called monoliths, were popularized in, in that book series, but then 2001 was a movie and then uh, 2000, uh, I think 10 was the sequel. But then there's 2064. And then there's 3001, are the third and fourth books. Anyway, I read them all. I'm a geek. Anyway, these monoliths are natural formations that occur. For example, on Earth, it's usually just an upright stone or, or a large object. Uh, Uluru in Australia is considered one of the biggest, if not the biggest, monolith on Earth. There's a picture of that. It's essentially this giant mound, almost like a plateau of rock that it's kind of out of place. It's not a normal formation. Uh, there's nothing mysterious necessarily about it, but it is in a sense a monolith and um, and it gives us kind of good grounds for starting. Now before we get into what moon monolith is referring to, I want to talk about a few more examples. We have this example on Earth, you have the pop culture reference, and now we have on Phobos, one of the moons of Mars, there is a building-sized monolithic structure on its surface. You can see it from space. There's a top-down photo of it in black and white, as is popular. And the reason why it is a monolith is because it, when you look at the photo, you see this very large, skinny shadow, indicating that there is a tall, 
like jutting structure out of the ground. It's not like a mountain that kind of gradually comes up and comes down. It It is this tall, skinny structure, and the sun is casting a shadow, and that's how we were able to it's like find a see moon it. nipple. It's like a moon nipple. Very long yeah. nipple. <laughs> um, and those shadows are what enable us to see these. And the reason why these started to get hyper-popularized and kind of stoking the curiosity is because when Buzz Aldrin, the second man to walk on the on the moon, landed and started walking around, you know, he started talking about these monoliths. He started talking about these odd structures. And his excitement and I interest... Never knew that. Yeah, and his excitement and interest in this stuff led to many people believing that it could be, you know, maybe he's hinting at something. Maybe he knows something. And, and there were also other... And this is another just reason for me to go off, but there are comms from the Apollo 11 crew as they went to land of things that they saw while on the moon. Supposedly, they were saying things that are there are like things living in the craters or things moving around on the surface of the moon that we just don't want to talk about. We just don't acknowledge them because we don't know what's going on. What? I told I told uh, Christian before this episode started that I just want to do a full dive into all of these things. What? A full episode. We need to do a full dive into that. What? We need to do a full episode there on are actually comms. That there say, are like, yeah, there are astronauts. There are naval and army and uh, air force pilots uh, that have seen and UFOs just, yeah, and have sightings things, and they yeah. have been tracked by things and they, so and there are declassified yeah. comms that have that these I've recordings so i think it'd be worth a whole dive into a full episode just like all, all of these sightings that people have had right cuz i mean the moves, i'm just going off memory i, I mean the, the pilots and like naval teams and stuff like that like i've heard about that but like mm -hmm. the people on the moon like apollo 11 no idea so wait hold on like we talk about like things that are being classified and eventually they're declassified. Yeah. Why are they eventually declassified? Is it just like after a certain amount of time they have to d just dump secrets? Like I don't understand. I think it depends on the nature of those things. Like for example, Christian it. and I were talking last year on uh, well, as of the time of this recording in 2021, I think it was around June that there was a lot of or that time-ish. There was a lot of UFO information declassified. And right. so a lot of people were like, "Here come the aliens." Like and I think what it is, is on one hand, it could be the trickling of information to the masses to air quotes, prepare people for the truth. And then there's also the other side of it, which is sometimes you want to withhold scientific research because it's not ready, because we haven't confirmed or denied things. And you want to take time to research it, whether it be for competitive edge or right. for understanding the nature of this existence. And if you start declassifying them willy nilly, it might lead to false conclusions. I mean, prematurely and, doing that. Yeah. yeah. Or it could lead to other intelligences, whether it be allies or foes in the world right. getting your information. Like, there's a lot of reasons to classify something. Yeah. But. So many times I'm like, all right, well, it's been 10 years and this is declassified now. Like, oh, why? Yeah. It's basically yeah. because, <clears throat> yeah, when you classify something, there's an automatic declassification kind of time limit. And they can they can set that time limit whether it's like 10 years or 20 years i think the max is 25 years and so unless they take action to keep it classified it will just eventually lapse and become declassified you know what was classified that kept getting kicked that is crazy there were jfk files the assassination files that kept getting kicked that maintained their classification and i believe it was under the last presidency that that was either going to be allowed to lapse or did lapse. The reason why I'm not sure is because there was a lot of hubbub leading up to that date where it was supposed to be right. declassified. And then after that, it was crickets. Basically, which told me if nothing that, hit yeah, the zeitgeist, then there was nothing it. of consequence in those files. You know, the grassy knoll situation and right, yep. the truths of it all. Um, oh, man. Christian's looking that up to see for a fact or not. But again gotta keep it. I'm glad I got my notes in front of me because I gotta keep it straight. This is one of those topics that I could just float away. Right. No, no oh, pun intended. Man. But so anyway, there are monolithical structures out there. Whether they're, you know, rocks or otherwise is yet to be seen. Mostly rocks. But that's where we're starting. Now, moon monoliths really struck a chord with the world because when you look at a planet's surface, you could see tall structures because of the sun casting shadows. But there are other ways. For example, I want to say it was a Chinese satellite that is kind of orbiting and taking a look at the moon. They also have 
rovers on the moon that are kind of an analyzing the surface and whatnot. And we'll get there, but one of these satellite photos, I can't believe it, if it was from China or us, the United States, but when it looked at the kind of edge of the moon as it took a photo, you're seeing kind of a tangential hit of the surface, which gives you an opportunity to see things jutting off of it. And there was one such hyper, I'm talking very tall, proportionally speaking, spire coming off of the moon. So basically, when you look at a photo of the moon, you're looking at the surface. But when you look around the edge of that photo, you're seeing if, if anything juts off of that, you're seeing a, t a tower, right? And so right, yeah. there was one such long nipple hanging off the moon and people were like, what is that? Because it was a rocky structure yeah. and it had no reason to physically need to be there or why would it not be knocked down? How would it form? These are the questions that a lot of people had. Well, didn't recently, was there were, um, there was one recently, I think it was uh, like China had a rover and yes. there was a structure Yes, and they're like, "What is that structure in the distance?" And Absolutely. they went, and it was like, you know, just like a pillar or something. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll actually jump to that because I have that in my notes. China's rover Luda Two photographed what they thought, and uh, you know, this is a photograph from the surface, was a cube shape of some sort, mm -hmm. eighty meters away from the from the rover itself. So it was going to take about two to three months to get there, and this was back in not even that far ago from now, December of twenty twenty one. So they're like on the horizon, you know. This I'm gonna show Fredo again. All the photos can be seen on our Twitter page at Red Web Pod. But that's what it looked like. Yeah, that's it so looked suspicious. like a, a chunk on the horizon. It does. And uh, as with all humans, we want to put patterns to things. And so when you look at that, there's a dark spot in the middle of it. And mm -hmm. so people started referring to it as the Mystery Hut because it looks a bit like yeah, a house. This, this pizza Hut is copyrighted. Well, of course, right, right. <laughs> and uh, well. Uh, I think actually a week ago, as of recording this episode, it was there's an update where they took a photo of it much more close up. Yeah, it's very recent. And it's just a rock. Here you go. There's a photo of that rock. It looked... Wait, I mean, the picture doesn't give me any scale, but... It no, that's the scary thing about the moon. You got no scale. Right. So I'm it looks like it's just a pebble on the on the it ground. It looks like but, a pebble on the ground, but I'm assuming it's a giant rock. Right. Oh, it have to. It would have to be huge. It's it's also weird too when you see a giant rock on the moon and then you see a bunch of what look like pebbles around it, and you go, no, 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 those pebbles around it are human sized. That's insane. Because this photo, I mean, like it looks. You go outside here, you don't have human sized pebbles no. just hanging. No, you don't. I mean, until you go to like a, a or canyon or something. Conspiracy theorists are probably like, oh, they just took a picture of some random rock, magnified yeah. it up, and be like, oh, it's this one. And they really found something. But, uh, I mean... Yeah, what would a government do with that information? Like, our government? And they just go, huh, all right. I mean, they keep looking. I mean, they, they work with... They work internationally to be like, hey, China, all right, you've got a rover on the surface. Let's get over there and t take a look. I mean, but kind of going backwards in my notes, I'm too excitable to jump back to the moon, <laughs> yeah, the moon yeah. monolith. I'm trying to basically lay the groundwork for monoliths throughout the solar system that have been found. There is one also, speaking of Phobos, a moon of Mars, there is one also on Mars. This, you know, aptly named Mars monolith very closely resembles to the monolith shown in Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's much more rectangular. Also, it was photographed at a bit of an angle, so you can see the structure as well as the shadow. Uh, take a look at that. Yeah, it just looks like a random... It looks... Just like pillar. Looks like a, a, a rectangular pillar stood up. rock pillar stood up, mm -hmm. where everything else just, just seems flat, or maybe a small crater. Yeah. It just seems so out of place. Very. Uh, now, this one, is, of course, is much more rectangular than the other ones seen, especially the one on Phobos. But the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter photographed this rock from about 180 miles away, uh, also, you know, about 290 kilometers. And though, you know, it, we're, it's very interesting, the fact that it lies at the bottom of a cliff on Mars suggests that it might be as mundane as a rock that fell in a certain way. And um, a rock that fell off this cliff and landed this way and... Uh, is otherwise nothing to be kind of looked at closer. Hmm. But uh, anyway, coming back to the moon now, you know, there's there's a pattern of monoliths across the solar system that have been looked at and analyzed and have been found to be less than exciting. Now, I've talked about some of these spires seen on the moon, uh, and I want to talk about one in particular that was seen in 2016. It was this castle-like structure that was photographed by a member of the UFO research group Secure Team 10. 
They claim that in addition to the size of it jutting off the surface of the moon, that there are also lights shining off of this white structure because, you know, maybe there's some bias in that they are a UFO research right. group. But either way, we don't have an answer. I mean, still, they bring the information forward. Everyone else is going to look at it, too. Mm-hmm. So that's the photo of it. You see the long shadow extending to the right. It's yeah. kind of like a... Looks like a backwards J. It is like a backwards J, for sure. There's also a photo in here that I don't have in my notes, but it... I'm, I was, I'm trying to find the right words to explain it, but it's basically just suffice to say there's just this another tall tower sticking off of the moon. So I found some info on the, the JFK stuff you guys were asking about. It was supposed to be made public everything in October of 2017 as a requirement from the JFK Act. The JFK Act essentially stated that though all the documents were supposed to be classified by law unless decreed otherwise by the president. And then in 2017, President Trump at the time released some of the documents, but delayed the release of some more at the behest of the FBI and CIA, who didn't want to release certain documents because they could, they could quote, pose a threat to national security. Sure. And then what? that delay from President Trump was supposed to have lapsed last year in October of 2021. And President Biden then tried to decree for the release and was once again asked by different agencies in the government to delay the release. And he agreed and said that the delay is until December 15th, 2022, later this year. But in the meantime, he said that any information currently withheld from public disclosure that agencies have not proposed for continued postponement were to be released by December 15th of last year. So so we're getting a trickle. It's, it's essentially a trickle, yeah. yeah. We got some stuff in October of 2017. We got yeah. some stuff last month in December of 2021. And we're supposed to get more in December of this year. But It is we'll someone's it job to, uh, to essentially look at those files, trickle some out, and then can kick to, to figure out what else they can yep. allow out. And just, I mean... Of course, with any mystery or even conspiracy, it calls into question, what you hiding? I get it, but it just, it, it builds a sense of allure around it. Just, yeah, a sense of suspicion, you know? It's like, why can't you release it? And I get there's probably names and stuff tied to it, and, mm -hmm. but I don't know, it's very interesting. Yeah. So that's essentially the long and short of it. Mostly short because there's not a lot of information about it. Now... Basically, to condense it all, because I know, you know, my my ADD is kicking in with all these space thoughts. <laughs> I want to I want to center this little mini mystery. Essentially, there are rocky formations on a couple different planets and moons out there in the solar system that call into question why they exist, because otherwise they shouldn't. Uh, the whether it's, you know, the Earth is very much alive in so many other planets. There are ge there's geothermal activity, the tectonic plates and shifting and and so that's how you get mountain ranges and, and random rocky formations. Now, the moon doesn't really have that as much. It might have in the past, but it doesn't really now. And so that's why when you look at Phobos, when you look at Mars, when you look at the moon, you start wondering, how did these monoliths form? There's a deeper question on how planets formed and everything there, but there's also the more conspiratorial side, which is, is this alien activity? Is this a building, right. a, a intentional structure, or some sort of, I don't know, monument? And I think it's a valid question to, to answer between those those kind of spots. Now, I always thought it was very interesting to see those because you otherwise think the moon is a, a relatively flat thing. Uh, and there are a couple of theories that try to address it. And I'm excited in the years to come to kind of look a little closer at some of these objects. Uh, obviously, one of the popular theories is that this is aliens, right? Uh, I'd be remiss if we didn't discuss that. And the reason why aliens is brought into the picture is because, as I mentioned, there's not a lot of planetary activity happening on these objects in space and so it just kind of aliens is the is the go-to answer for making it happen yeah right there are but then like the other theory is it's just a rock that these are just rocky formations and we have yet to discover the appropriate method with which they ended up there that somehow there are just seems these, so so precise it's very random. precise sure but upon closer look you know you look at what the luda 2 photographed in December 2021, and then you look at what it photographed last week, and very immediately something that began and fired up very quickly as a, 
oh my god, it's another monolith, oh my god, that's proof of aliens, very quickly then turned around to just be a rock. The same thing on Phobos is that, or rather the Mars one, we have a pretty mundane answer for how it got there. Is it the answer? We're not sure. But it seems that, you know, as much intrigue as is possible there, I think it must, I personally think that it must just be like, there are rocks in places that kind of stand out as interesting, but we have just yet to figure out how exactly they got there. I don't know. Yeah, the one that the, was the Luna 2, the one that found like the picture of it at a distance and like on the horizon. Yeah. That seemed like a square. Then they got real close and it was, looks like just a regular rock. Form, right. Like, like a rectangular rock formation. Didn't yeah. Look like it had smooth edges like it did from a distance or anything like that. So, yeah, I mean, it could just be we're not up close, like, taking photos of these and these actual monoliths are just, like, some big... They look smooth and, and like, they were made with precision from right. a distance, but, I mean, when you get up close, it could just be just one giant-ass rock. I think it's just, it's just another one of those things, just like these other topics, is that it is a symptom of something we have yet to know. And with any mystery, there is room to go down the rabbit hole of some really interesting and clever creative even solutions right aliens and and the whatnot but then there's also the other more mundane side which is just i mean rocks from mars have made their way to earth it's totally possible that this is just one such mm. rock that, that made was, it to the moon yeah whether it's from mars or elsewhere and it just, just made it itself yeah due to, due to its density maybe it just created this spire of some sort or maybe the moon used to be way more active but i don't know it, it's definitely intriguing enough, but I wish there was more information because I would love to theorize in a deeper sense. Yeah, I mean, I think what gives me enough to satisfy my hunger for the knowledge on this part is just the Luna 2. And, yeah. Right? Or it's just like we saw a monolith from a distance, went up, was nothing. Yeah. I mean, even, you know, the that monolithic structure in Australia, if, if this planet were a strange one and we looked at it, we would see a giant shadow cast from that and we would wonder... How did that get there? I mean, to be fair, I guess aliens could have created that and put right. that there. But also, and and I don't, I'm not a geologist, but I imagine that there are better understood patterns of this planet that created that. And eventually this planet will die and that will probably still be there for a future civilization to go, how did it get there? It's, right. <laughs> it's, it's just what I love about space is that there are all these intriguing things, observations out there and any answer is a viable one until you've figured it out. And that's just science at large. But now this reminds me of another little mystery that I, I don't know if you'd even be able to figure, like to dig into it, Christian, but there's another mystery about these deep space, like alienoid creatures. Somebody had, I'm going off the deep end now here at the end of the episode. But still, but still. But like somebody was more. taking photos through a telescope deep into space and they were seeing what looked like jellyfish creatures, like these like, Almost Holy nebula hell. color right. structures that moved. And so some people saw them as these intergalactic ships. And some people saw them as like space aliens that live in space. I don't know. I don't even know where I'm going anymore. But I, all that is, is there are plenty of other mysteries that oh. I would love to personally try to yes. dive into. Yes, this is such a fun one. Yeah. Oh, man, I feel like... The problem with space conversation in me is that I can't ever close the door. I can't ever end it. I could just keep going and talking. Well, yeah, that's why we do more episodes because oh, this is just so much fun. Uh, space is so intriguing to me. It's just there's just so many tangents that we can go off on. And, yeah, and that's what I love about this in particular. Yeah, I've I've heard from a few members of the task force, and I and I kind of want to put this question out to you all listening. Um. I've been noodling on the idea of a spin-off podcast. It wouldn't be Red Web in any sense. I'd probably do this with maybe Gus Sorolla, who is another, oh, yeah. who is another scientific fiend. He's uh, one of the co-hosts of Black, Black Box, Box Down. Down. If you're interested in true crime in the air, essentially, they, dis they discuss airplane crashes and what went wrong and everything. But uh, kind of a sister podcast to this one, but of doing a simple science show. Each season covers a different topic. He explains something. I explain something. If that's something you'd be interested in, this like, as another podcast, as a different podcast, I totally to un, you know unattached to this one. Let me know. You find out what liquid I could scoop up next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, what am I taking a scoop of now? Uh, yeah. What we do is we bring on Fredo. We give him a handful of some <laughs> object, and we walk him through. 
Uh, what are you, what are you <laughs> scooping? What, what am I scooping today? Yeah. And for our next Scoop It segment. <laughs> <laughs> and then as we mentioned at the top of the episode, don't forget we have merch coming on February 15th. We've got a hoodie as well as, uh, you know, we've been teasing it for months, but it's finally here. The Cryptid Pin Set. So if you are a pin collector, now's the time to jump Hell on that yeah. at store.roosterteeth.com. But yeah, this has been space, just scratching the surface. Mm. There is so much yet to be discussed as far as mysteries are concerned. If you have any that you've heard about that you want us to discuss, any that you uh, want us to discuss that you know a lot about, send us your resources. Uh, let us know. Yeah. But uh, otherwise, we'll see you next week, Fredo, here on Red Web. Never forget, bears beats Bowser Galactic.